and she incorporated some behavioral strategies as well. So we had the cognitive piece of reframing some of my thought patterns, but the behavior piece was exposure therapy as well. And so we would practice not exposure therapy in the sense of me, you know, dosing eating peanuts, but exposure of being around peanuts um, and practicing what that was like for me. Could you do me a massive favor and click follow or subscribe button? It helps the podcast out so much. Great. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I feel like we've collaborated online for like a few years now, but never actually yeah. got to like fully connect, obviously virtually, but um, I'm so excited to be here. So thanks for having me. No, it's an absolute pleasure, obviously, getting the opportunity to have you on the podcast. Are you based in Chicago? Yes, based in Chicago. Um, grew up in the Midwest my whole life, um, but have been living in Chicago the past almost four years now. Yeah. And what's the time difference? Is it is it in the morning currently for yourself? Over? Yes. I was trying to figure out because I wanted to make sure, obviously, yeah. we logged on at the same yeah, time. Same time. Um, I yeah, so it's 10 o'clock here, um, 10 a.m., and so yeah. it's what three three o'clock for you? It's about it's about three p.m. But I was up, I was up quite early this morning because I had like a Greek okay. lesson at like ten a.m. So I had to get my coffee to get me get the day going. If we go back to like your so and your kind of your journey with allergies, how old were you when you kind of found out about your food allergies? Yeah. So my story is a little bit interesting because my older brother actually had food allergies and that his finding out about his allergies is really what helped my family find out about my allergies. So my older brother is about two years older than me. Um, he would have allergic reactions when he was little to nuts. Um, he was also allergic to some legumes and things like that. And so they found out pretty young for him that he was allergic. And so by the time that I started getting into eating solid foods, anything that I didn't want to touch, my parents would not like force me to eat because they weren't sure if this was going to be an allergy case, for me yeah. as well. Sure. And so by the time, um, I would say probably by age three, they had gotten me tested. Um, and then I was able to confirm my peanut allergies, tree nuts. I tested positive for seafood. And at that point, um, they also had me avoiding raw tomatoes, raw eggs, apples, bananas as an oral allergy syndrome. Um, and so I had kind of a whole list going um, from really early on. How has that experience been then, obviously, when you get diagnosed with an allergy quite young and kind of like growing up with an allergy as well? Was there anyone you kind of looked to at the time? Obviously, you've got you've got the blog now, but before you kind of started the blog, how was that kind of journey for you? Yeah, and I think I've I've talked on All Things Allergies a lot that that was a big inspiration for starting my blog is that I didn't really have those resources, those role models um, to be able to look to to have my questions answered. So, of course, I had my brother who was two years older than me. He was navigating peanuts and tree nut allergies as well. So it was nice that our home was just kind of free of all of those things. Um, and then I had, I remember like two kids in my elementary class that had like peanut or milk allergies too. So we were always, you know, at together. the peanut table together. Um, so I had, you know, like my little cohort of people who had a similar, you know, kind of experience to me, but there wasn't these online resources in the same way that, uh, we definitely see now. So mm. that was definitely tough, but being so young when I was diagnosed, I've never known anything different. So that's always just been my experience. It's obviously nice to have like your brother as well. That must be quite nice. Uh, he's obviously going through it. Has he still got allergies now? He does. Yes. I keep telling him to go back and get tested because after I got my most yeah. recent test and got to knock off a bunch of stuff, I'm trying to send him in. So Tyler, if you're out there listening, you go should, get tested. You should get, you should get, you should get him on your blog because I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I didn't realize until like kind of later on when I was kind of reading your blog articles that your brother had a food allergy as well. Yes. Yeah. So we've really had similar ones almost our whole lives. Um, I had all the seafood allergies and he didn't. Um, but we both were avoiding peanuts and tree nuts. Um, he's very allergic to chickpeas as well. And so that was one that I had had. Um, and so it was always kind of nice that like whatever foods I couldn't have, he couldn't have. I mean, I guess in um, exception for the seafood, but um, we always would have one person try it and be like, is this safe? Yeah. And that if, if he was OK, I would be OK and we would try it. So it was always nice to have that kind of like partner growing up who um, had a similar experience to me. Um, 
but yeah, so he he has allergies as well. And he at this point is still avoiding peanuts and tree nuts and legumes, um, but hoping to get him in because maybe his experience will be similar to mine and grow out of some of those things. We'll see. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, how is it obviously like growing up? Did you always feel like quite confident, like speaking up about your allergy when you obviously like, because obviously when you kind of take on that responsibility, it can be really difficult sometimes obviously with that whole like anxiety and obviously feeling empowered how's that experience been for you when you was kind of grown up I think just as my temperament as a kid I was much more shy I was not very outspoken Um, I was definitely an anxious kid an anxious temperament and so it wasn't my norm to want to speak up and you know have those conversations with people or kind of draw that attention to myself was not something I was normally comfortable with but I had my first allergic reaction by first grade. And so at that point, it really became apparent that I was going to have to speak up about these things. And when I'm alone at school and my parents weren't there to advocate for me, that I had to be my own advocate. And so I really had to learn that lesson kind of young. And so definitely wasn't something that came naturally to me. And I know, and it's still something that's tough for me now. Um, And I talk about that on my blog, that this is something we have to do. Um, and so I always try to, you know, practice what I preach and take my own advice yeah. that if I'm going to tell other people to advocate and step up. I've got to do the same thing, even when it's tough. And I think having an analogy as well, I think for me personally, is like that anxiety. And I know it happens for people at different ages. For me, it happened a bit later on in life when I was maybe like 24, 25. And I think it's from like blogging about allergies and like constantly Mm -hmm. reading about it and it it's hard because like I really want to like raise awareness but also the implications of that sometimes it can make me anxiety worse what age was you when when you first kind of experienced like having anxiety because of your allergy definitely really peaked in first grade after this first anaphylactic reaction that I had um my first what 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 age is what age is first grade sorry oh um so I was like about six years old Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So six years old, um, and I, it was Valentine's Day. Um, we were celebrating in my classroom in first grade. We had, you know, our cute little Valentine's Day boxes, and you would bring them in for your classmates and put them in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the thing about Valentine's Day candy is it's different colors and different shapes than it normally is. So I had known that, you know, a Butterfinger is yellow and a Reese's is like kind of orange. So I need to stay away from those things. I mean, at six, you're still really learning to read. And so going into the back of the label and being able to see if this has peanuts or not was really tough for a six-year-old. And so when I came home, I had my candy box and I knew to avoid the yellow Butterfingers and the orange Reese's, but everything was pink and heart-shaped and red and Valentine's Day. And so... I had bitten into a Butterfinger um, without realizing and had my first anaphylactic reaction there at home. Um, Thankfully, my parents were there and they were able to help me. Um, But that is really where the anxiety really took off, I think, because at that point, I had a really difficult time um, eating and moving forward after that because I didn't trust that what I was going to eat was going to be safe. Um, Because it was such a scary experience for me. I remember, you know, my feeling of my throat constricting, feeling really paralyzed um, and having that difficulty breathing. And as a six year old, not really being able to comprehend, you know, what was going on, why that was happening. Um, So it was really tough after that. My it's a little bit harder for me to remember the details since I was young. But my parents say not wanting to go to school after that, really having difficulty separating from them always wanting to be with my parents, difficulty sleeping, not wanting to eat. Um, And that kind of continued for a while. And I think the whole rest of my life really took a whole different level of caution um, and an anxiety just being hypervigilant of my surroundings um, for a long time. And I think it really took up until I started going to therapy to kind of recognize that that was my whole childhood experience. What age did you start going to therapy? Because I remember reading one of your blog posts and you kind of spoke about a severe reaction when you was 17. Yes, yes. Can, can, my... can we talk about that? Because it felt like from reading that was, that, was that the turning point for getting therapy? Or was it before that? Yeah, no, you're right. That that was the turning point. So I had this reaction in first grade when I was six. And then fast forward 
it was between my junior and senior year of high school. So I was about 17. Um, and I had another allergic reaction then um, to some ice cream over the summer with friends and really, again, having a lot of those really difficult symptoms afterwards um, of really confusing. Was I feeling anxious? Am I having symptoms again? Yeah. Um, not wanting to eat, not wanting to um, just like live my life as a normal kid. I, I was so afraid. I was so hypervigilant of everything surfaces felt dirty, feeling like I constantly needed to wash my hands, all those really um, standard PTSD symptoms um, yeah. and not realizing that that's what it was in the moment. But that was definitely the turning point for me and my family um, of starting to have these panic attacks that, you know, we needed to talk to somebody and, and figure out what was going on and how we could help me. Um, and so it was probably a few months later into the fall, I think maybe um, three or four months after the reaction is when I went to therapy for the first time. Was it was it was it quite difficult trying to find someone who specializes within allergies? Because I know getting therapy in the UK it's actually really difficult. There's only like very few people um, which offer that service. How was that in kind of Chicago and trying to find the right person for you? Mm -hmm. So at this point, when I was in high school, I was actually back in Michigan because I was still living with my parents, but just living in the, you know, smallish town that I grew up yeah. in. Um, and we didn't even, I don't even think we entertained the idea that there could be somebody that would have experience in allergies. Um, we, I don't even think that that was like a concept in our heads. And so it's probably not a did, thing back then. Is, yeah. Because I feel like right. it's only recently, like, I find that like, more people i think in the in the uk there's like an issue of like funding and and trying to get the results i know it's a little bit better over in the us but yeah i can imagine like maybe like 10 15 years ago yeah there wasn't any at all right. essentially yeah because th this was 2014 i would say and so we were like just trying to find a therapist or like somebody that i would click with um so we had um like a friend's mom was in the field and so she helped refer us to somebody and um, the therapist that I worked with had no experience in allergies. And that ended up being okay. We were able to, you know, it took a lot on mine and my family's part to kind of like educate her on what we were going through um, and what my food allergies were and what those kind of, um, you know, what was safe, what wasn't safe, what kind of yeah, degree yeah. of interaction I could have with allergies because so much of the work we did together was what is like a a maladaptive thought or what is like a hypervigilant thought versus what is an actual line you need to have for safety. So like an actual food allergy line for safety is I cannot touch the allergen. Okay. We know that. Yeah. But can I be in a room with an allergen? Can I be in a room with somebody else eating the allergen? Those are kind of those like toss up questions where is this something that I'm personally afraid of, but is still going to be safe or not? And so those were kind of those tricky lines that we would always fall into where I'm having difficulty making that distinction of what is a maladaptive thought and what is a safety concern. Um, and I'm supposed to be the one telling her that, but I'm the one that's struggling to draw that line. And so that's really where this challenge, I think, really came in because we wanted to work on exposure therapy and kind of challenging some of those thoughts that I was having but how can I tell her what is a safe boundary if I'm having difficulty figuring yeah. out the boundaries? So that is where a food allergy counselor would have really, really come in handy. And was it was it CBT or was it talking therapy or was it a bit of both? Because it's something that I'm trying to look into at the minute and I think I need like potentially like a bit of both. Um, was was CBT right for you at the time? Is that the one you went with? Yeah, so it was definitely a mix. It was talk therapy um, was basically like the big foundation, but her orientation was CBT. And so she practiced from a CBT lens and she incorporated some behavioral strategies as well. So we had the cognitive piece of reframing some of my thought patterns, but the behavior piece was exposure therapy as well. And so we would practice not exposure therapy in the sense of me, you know, dosing, eating peanuts, but exposure of being around peanuts um, and practicing what that was like for me. And so completely different than, you know. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Um, was that under like medical like 
um, was it like medical superstition? I don't know. Like, like was you quite worried that obviously, like, obviously, if peanuts are right next to you, I could have a reaction right now with your therapist? So. Yeah. So that was kind of some boundaries that we had to create with my family as well to make sure we decided like what was going to be like safe from a medical perspective about my allergies. And but then what is a healthy way we could challenge um, kind of like from the psych side of things, like the mental health side. And so there's been plenty of situations where at that point in my life, I, you know, am in the lunchroom with people eating peanuts or there's, you know, people eating peanuts when we're you know, at the swim club or whatever it is. And so I'd be around peanuts. Maybe I got to pick kind of like this distance that I had from peanuts. But what me and my therapist would do is she would sit in the other corner of her office and it was a pretty big office. And then I would sit in the other corner and she would eat peanuts. Now, we wouldn't obviously have this, um, this contact. I wasn't touching the peanuts. She wouldn't touch me after she ate the peanuts. We had these like boundaries that we set up but practiced what this kind of distance would be like um in a real life scenario because that happened to me very often and i'm i'm sure you feel the same way yeah you're on the train you're on wherever and you don't get to control that people are eating peanuts around you all the time um so this was something that took you know a lot of precaution um and i have had these conversations with people in my program now and kind of talking about what are like the ethics of that kind of like exposure therapy. And it's certainly not for everyone. Um, I didn't know I this mean, was a thing. Like, yeah, because when you said that, I was like, oh, what? They actually eat peanuts like in the same room. Like that's, that's yeah, it's interesting because I've never heard that before kind of thing. Yeah. And to be honest, I don't know if a food allergy informed therapist now would use that strategy. But I think that that even speaks to how little of the knowledge back in 2014 of a, a therapist who doesn't have that experience, um, who doesn't have that food allergy like informed lens that mm -hmm. use relying on those like behavior therapy strategies um, in almost treating food allergy as a phobia and if you i'm doing finger quotes right now um, yeah. because it's not a phobia because for something to be a phobia it has to be um irrational and it's not irrational to be afraid of our allergens um but behavior therapy and exposure therapy the kind of track that she was using with me it's very typical for treating phobias and so personally i'm not sure if that is the direction i would take moving forward as the clinician um, yeah. If I were in her shoes and I think that largely food allergy clinicians now probably wouldn't take that approach. But I think that that really speaks to this difference of 10 years ago without food allergy informed therapists, what that treatment looks like versus now probably taking a different approach. Do I think that the work that she did with me was helpful? Yes. Do I think it's the exact treatment I maybe needed, wanted the most beneficial? Maybe not. And so I'm not saying that what I had before was the gold standard. Um, but in 2014, that was the therapy that I went through for better or for worse. No, no, that no, honestly, I appreciate that. And it's good, obviously, if you be so open and honest about that, like it might not be the gold standard. But like, like you said, back then, there was a lack of um, awareness and kind of the knowledge about the kind of food allergies. So yeah, it's really interesting to get your thoughts on that. Was there any tools you kind of took forward later on in life where you do feel that anxiety kind of come on when you're in a restaurant or eating out? Was there any tools you've kind of took forward and what are them tools to kind of help you? In a program. Yeah, so one of the most important, I think, tools that I took from working with her at this point was focusing on my breathing because that was something that I was really struggling with post-reaction before I even came into therapy. Um, I was on the swim team in high school, and so that is something that's very restricting of your breathing. Um, and I found that to be really anxiety-inducing because you know, my coach would have us do laps where like you're not allowed to breathe or like you try to stay underwater the whole time. And I really, really had a challenge doing that because that was just a few months post reaction where my body legitimately could not breathe because my my throat was constricting. Um, and so then doing that for quote unquote fun or for practice for swimming mm -hmm. 
that was very anxiety provoking. And so in other situations, if I had eaten something and I wasn't sure if, um, you know, it had an allergen in it or not, that kind of trying to decide is this anxiety, is this um, allergies, really finding my breath to be something that I really needed to lean on because that felt like that um, kind of physical symptom that was waning. And so something that me and her worked on a lot was box breathing, deep breathing, um, and being able to ground myself and kind of refocus on my breath and knowing that if I could breathe and I could get these deep breaths that that's going to calm my anxiety. And that's also um, kind of an indicator that this is not allergies. Um, being able to maintain that really steady breath um, and kind of feel that groundedness. Like calm down, yeah. How, how do you distinguish when it is like a panic attack or is it allergic reaction? It's something I, I still really like struggle with now. Like, I eat out and I'm like, went to like the cinema recently on the way to the cinema. I was like, I feel like I'm having an allergic reaction because something I eaten before Invo, it didn't have nuts in it. And obviously it didn't say anything about may contain on, on the packaging. It's um, and I was like watching this film, like not particularly enjoying it because like, I thought I was going to have a, but I was, I was absolutely fine. How do you kind yeah. of distinguish the difference? Is that something, because it'd be great to hear your insights on that because that's something I kind of <laughs> deal with as well. Yeah. And I think that that is kind of like, um, to me, it's like, what is the meaning of life? Like those questions yeah. are like synonymous with me because it feels like there's like no solid answer. Um, and I think... Uh, and I agree with you. This was something that I really, really struggled with and probably one of the biggest struggles that I had post anaphylaxis and feeling like, you know, you eat something and so many of the anaphylaxis symptoms overlap with panic symptoms. And it's, you know, the racing heartbeat, it's difficulty breathing, the chest um, tightness, um, those feelings of doom, impending doom. Um, those are the same exact symptoms to anaphylaxis. And so when we're feeling those, we're reminded back to the traumatic event, which was our food allergic reaction. And that's exactly the way that PTSD works in post-traumatic symptoms is you're reminded of that event. And so we're eating a food, we're feeling those same exact symptoms as anxiety that we felt were anaphylaxis, mm. and that is sending our brain into high alert because it says, here we go again. And so... It was really, really challenging for me to distinguish in the months following my allergic reaction. And I don't think I was ever really successful into being able to differentiate it with anything except for time. Because time was, okay, if it's been an hour and I haven't fully needed mm -hmm. to use my EpiPen, then okay, this probably wasn't an allergic reaction. Um, and panic can kind of, you know, after a while after a set of time is going to stop itself, um, where anaphylaxis really wouldn't. So that was really my only strategy for a while. And so going into therapy was one of those ways to try to differentiate those. And it took a really long time to be able to even stand a chance at trying to pick apart the two of them. Um, I think one of the big ones was being able to, to focus on the breath and then if I felt like I could take deep, steady, solid breaths, not only could I start to calm my mind down a little bit to think a little bit more rationally, but I could figure out if I was able to get good deep breaths because that was not something I could do if I was having an allergic reaction. And then something I really focused on too was those more physical symptoms of what um, anaphylaxis would look like. So if that was like a scratchy throat or like lumps in the throat, um, or like physical hives on my body. So I would always try to remind myself, okay, if I'm not seeing hives on my body, if my throat, you know, maybe it feels tight, but is there lumps in it? Does it feel scratchy? Does it feel like, you know, an allergen was in there? Because that was definitely a symptom that I felt when I was actually having a reaction was... That's was, interesting. Yeah, because I've yeah. never... I say I've never had anaphylaxis. There's one experience when I thought I was, but I, looking back, I thought that was a panic attack. But yeah. you, when you've obviously ex experienced that with something you've eaten and obviously contain your allergen, what does it feel like for you? So like you mentioned like lumps on the throat. Is that is that the usual symptoms where you feel like this could be more serious than just an allergic reaction? Yeah, and 
my very first reaction that I had when I was in first grade, it was like instant, immediate. Like I didn't even, I I never had it before. Um, so because it was my first time having anaphylaxis, I think that like I knew something was wrong immediately. And it happened like by the second that it got into my mouth, um, I could tell that my body was going into anaphylaxis. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't much to have to distinguish at that age or at that time because it, it was very obvious and it was very immediate. And I think the issue that really came up for me is the reaction that I had later at 17 was much more delayed. So I had eaten the allergen, I had gone home, and then my first symptom was kind of like in my stomach, that my stomach felt like it was swirling. Um, and then I was like, oh, maybe I should take a Benadryl. And then it started to really go from there. And that's when I started to feel it in my throat and I got really nauseous, felt like the, the walls were kind of closing in on me. Again, really similar to panic symptoms, yeah. but when we had gone to the emergency room, that was something that they had noted as seeing those kind of lumps in my throat. And so this kind of longer delayed reaction is really what became tricky for me. because I was like, okay, if it's going to happen the millisecond it goes in my mouth, then I'm going to know that that was anaphylaxis. But we kind of have this delayed period like I had the second time. That's where all those room for anxious thoughts come in. And it could potentially be anxiety could potentially be anaphylaxis and so relying on that kind of scratchy throat has been something that's helpful for me um is knowing that that is a, a symptom that i have had before um maybe that won't be my experience god forbid i have another reaction but um that was something that was kind of like another grounding experience for me is feeling those physical symptoms are they there or is this likely something else yeah and i thought it was obviously Obviously, years later, you went for another kind of allergy test to kind of check your different allergens. Can we talk about kind of the story behind that and how that, how that kind of like came about? Yeah, so I, at this point, I had, you know, I had had the reaction uh, when I was 17, then I moved to college. I was at the Ohio State University for four years, and then I moved to Chicago in 2019, um, and I've been there ever since. But um, and 2019 is when I started All Things Allergies, my blog. And then um, I think it was by 20, must have been 2020 or 2021. Um, I was like, you know what? I need to establish an allergist here in the city because Chicago, I'm doing my degree is a, a five-year program. I know I'm going to be here for a while. Let's, you know, establish an allergist here in the yeah. city. And so... I hadn't been tested since I had went away for college. So it had been probably like five or six years. And so it was time for me to go back. Um, I'm not a big fan of blood draws. So I was kind of like pushing it off. I didn't want to get the blood oh, test. Avoiding it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was just kind of like, uh, like I'll just, you know, keep living my norm, which was avoiding these allergens. And, you know, then I don't have to go in and, and go to the allergist. Because I've not had one in ages. Like, I, I think the last one I was like 18. Right. I'm like, fit, I'm like 30 now. And I'm like, oh God, like maybe, maybe I should go for like another one. But um, I don't know why I might keep putting it off. But yeah, I should definitely go just in case. Like. <laughs> right. Because it's easy, right? We're just like, okay, like this is, this is the life we live. This is the norm. It's easy just to keep living it. And like, what, yeah. what more information could the allergist give me? Well, in my case, it was a lot and I, it was good that I had finally went. Um, and I, w I was kind of joking. I had talked about this on um, a different kind of podcast that I was doing. And I was like, to be honest, I really wanted some content for my blog. It's like yeah. I wanted me going into the allergist. I wanted to get fresh numbers that I could share. Um, I had no indication that I thought some of these allergies were going to be gone. I just wanted... I was like, oh, I'll make a post about it. Here's me going to yeah, the allergist. Yeah, get some content. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so funny because it turned into a whole a whole other thing. And so I had gone in, I braved the blood trial, got that done. Um, and they had called me a few weeks later and they had said, you know, you're only showing high IgE levels for peanut. You Like everything else is undetectable. And I was like, no, there's no way. And I was like, they must have done this wrong. This allergist office, they must not know what they're doing. Like, yeah, they got, they got blood, the numbers wrong. Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. I was like, no way. And they were like, no, like, 
your your numbers are really undetectable. I mean, peanut is definitely there. We had done the component testing for peanut, so that was, you know, that was confirmed. But they're like everything else, they're like, you could go eat these things right now. And I remember I was I'll be like, like I'll be like so blown away. If someone said that to me right <laughs> now, I'd be like, What? I no, I, I wouldn't trust it. Yeah. I can understand like, how you felt like that. Yeah. Absolutely not. And I was I remember I was sitting in the parking lot of Whole Foods and I was like so you want me to walk into Whole Foods right now and buy an almond and put it in my <laughs> mouth? I was like, this lady is crazy. She's off her and, edge, yeah. <laughs> so then at that point, I, I was really was having trouble comprehending this information. Um, and I was like, I'm, I want to come back in. I want you to do a skin test just to confirm, a skin prick test, because I'm sure that I'm going to get hives. There's no way I can have this on my skin. Because I yeah. identified so strongly with having these allergies to tree nuts and to seafood and all of these other things. So a few weeks go by, I go in, I get the skin test. I sit there, you know, with my palms out. Um, and I, for 20 minutes, can sit there and see if these hives are going to develop or not. Getting worse, yeah. And they don't. Nothing comes up. Um, the histamine one came up, you know, the, the trial. I was like, oh, that's got to be it. That's yeah. got to be almond. But it wasn't. They all came back negative. And it was such a important experience for me to be able to sit there and visually see it. I think that getting those it must numbers- must have been a shock as well. Yeah, like imagine yeah. like you've lived with it like your whole life and then to kind of do a test and like everything comes back like negative. You must be like, what's going on? Like, right, and, and I'm sitting there in this food allergy kid identity that I've had at that point for 24 years of my life is visibly kind of like going away. And I think I needed that visual kind of representation, that visual um, kind of proof that these allergies were not there for me. Um, I think without the skin test, I wouldn't have gone further and done food challenges just based on the IgE numbers, which are more accurate, but I needed to see it on my own skin, see it on my own body to really be able to yeah. start um, to reframe some of those thoughts that I've had for 24 years that and those thoughts that have kept me safe that avoiding these allergens is what has kept me safe my whole life and so it was at that point where I'd gotten this negative skin test with the negative IgE test that I started to entertain the idea of maybe doing some food challenges which for the food challenges which one did you start off with so you did the test did it come back you, you're no longer allergic to seafood and legumes. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So it tested the, the tree yeah. nuts, I think, was the one that was most um, kind of significant for me. Um, but yeah. the the tree nuts and then um, the seafood and the legumes all came back negative. And the only thing that was still positive for the, on the IgE was the peanut. Yeah. I mean, so when you did the food kind of challenges, would you still look like a bit anxious going into it or was you or was you a bit more obviously you must have felt a bit more calmer knowing that obviously you've got the IG test and you've also done the skin prick test as well yes so at that point um at this point in my life I had started therapy here in Chicago and so it was during the pandemic it was probably it was 2020 um I was just looking to have another therapist um you know I was dealing with anxiety but not even so much food allergy related um, at least I thought. I thought it wasn't food allergy related. I thought it was just, you know, pandemic and all these other things and school life stress. Um, so I had started therapy in 2020. And so by the time I had gone and gotten these tests done, I had established a really good relationship with my new therapist here. And um, I remember going to my appointment with her and I was like, you'll never believe what the allergist said. They're trying to tell me I'm not allergic <laughs> to these things and they want me to go eat them and i thought she was gonna be like oh my gosh like that's crazy and then she sat there and she was like Alyssa, like this is this is really significant like you have the opportunity to take this power back mm -hmm. from these allergens that have held this power over you for so long and she um she takes a different approach to exposure therapy she took some um I think some difficulty with the ways that my previous therapist had tackled things. And so she had kind of taken a new approach to helping me work on food allergy stuff. And I think probably a better um, 
probably a better, more ethical, safer approach. Um, yeah. If I can say more personal experience. Um, and so she was like, I really think this is going to be something that's really great for you. And so she was patient with me. She let me, you know, take the time that I needed to get myself prepared for this. But that was a focus for a lot of our sessions is how can we prepare you to go do these food challenges? Because I think this is going to be really meaningful in your recovery journey from PTSD. And so I was like, I was like, I, I'm going to cancel my session. I'm not coming to see you again. Yeah. There's no way. I was very resistant to it. But she got me to a point where I felt like I was confident enough to go in um, and have this challenge. And so the very first one that I did was in the office here in Chicago, and it was for Almond. And I picked to do Almond first because I felt like it was kind of the tree nut I ran into the most. Um, you see like almond milk a lot and yeah. almond croissants. I just felt like it was kind of like the one I, almost, I could see. I was going to say when you did the challenge for Almond and then obviously you realize you're not allergic to it, it must completely change your mindset when you get a coffee. Because when I get a coffee, I'm paranoid mm -hmm. about the milk. It's like the number one thing, like almond milk. I just don't drink milk at all. I'm just like, this black Americano. Even now I get anxious. Depends who I'm with and what coffee establishment it is, but like even now, sometimes I, just, I don't even get a coffee. <laughs> just like just get a water. The well, the implications, and, and yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say it's funny you say that because until age 24, I never drank coffee because of that exact reason. Oh, wow. Because of the almond milk, the hazelnuts. Um, you know, they can have peanut butter stuff sometimes too, and so mm -hmm. I just I wasn't a coffee drinker. And I was in grad school, probably would like a coffee, like some energy, but um, yeah. would never go to a place and get coffee. It was just never something that I did in, until 24. And what was like the implications of obviously doing the challenges? Did your anxiety, I won't say your anxiety would ever stop straight away, but it must, you must, it must have lowered it in some ways as it, as it changed your life, knowing now that obviously, like you say, you can go out for coffee and the chances of you having an allergic reaction are next to nothing kind of thing mm -hmm. so one of the big things that we kind of worked on me and my therapist preparing for this first appointment was the idea of establishing the sense of safety and that's why she was really adamant about me doing this first appointment you know in the office she said if you're going to have an allergic reaction this is the absolute safest place on the planet for you to have it is you're sitting in this office with all these allerg with these allergists these nurses these doctors you're on a campus of a hospital they have the epipens this is what they do this is their full-time job and so she's like first of all you are safe no matter what happens if you have a reaction you're going to be safe because you're going to get the help that you need so establishing that sense of safety was huge and then we had kind of talked about wanting to differentiate what is anxiety, what is anaphylaxis, because that they come in every 15 minutes when you're doing the food challenge and they're like, do you have any symptoms of anaphylaxis? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I, I'm yeah, nervous. I think I'm so. Nervous. Yeah, like, yeah. It's so hard, but, but yeah. Right. So something that they do when they come in is they, they look in your throat to see if, you know, you've got anything going on. They ask if you're itchy. Um, they check your heart rate and they do your, um, your blood pressure. Maybe they take your pulse. So they do all these like kind of physical signs as well. I'm sure my heart rate was, you know, off the charts cause I Afraid was roof, nervous, yeah. but I had somebody checking on me every 15 minutes and they are the expert. They know what they're doing. And so they can tell if I, you know, need an injection, if I need some sort of antihistamine, that's their job to figure out. And so it sort of almost took like the pressure off of me to have to like tell them because they were doing yeah. all of these checks on me, which was really helpful. And so after I ate a few of them, it really calmed me down to be reminded, hey, I'm safe. I'm being checked on. And so far, so good. I was able to distract myself. I would, you know, I would plug my nose when I had to eat the almonds. So I thought they tasted bad. Yeah. Um, I took videos, which was something that was helpful was instead of making it like a scary event where I was eating almonds, I made it like a content creation and I filmed videos and- Did you put it on I like TikTok? Cause there's like some yes. TikTok videos of like Danielle Price have like got like tens of millions of views. Yes. And I know she's just recently started it again, but yeah, it's crazy. Like. 
Yeah, and it was my most um, like liked TikTok that I ever had was yeah. from then. And I was like, look at all these positives that had came out of it. And yeah. so that's exactly was my therapist advice is let's make this less scientific. Let's make this less like a medical procedure and let's make this fun. This is an exciting thing. You get to go try almonds for the first time after 24 years. Like this is really cool. And so I think that cognitive shift that like reframe and then establishing that sense of safety was what I needed to feel confident going into it. And that's exactly what she provided for me. And that's how I was able to get through it. Yeah, I know. And it, obviously having allergies, had obviously such a massive part of your life. And obviously you're a doctoral student at the Chicago School of Special Psychology, it's that. which we'll get to in a sec. Um, but if you didn't have an allergy, do you think your life would have took like maybe a bit of like a different path? Because obviously that's what you do now, obviously consulting you're for enough. psychology and helping people. If you didn't have that food allergy, I just thought it'd be interesting to hear whether you whether you would have took a, a different path in life, maybe. That is such a good question. And I don't know if I've really thought about that much before because I, I have always said that I think that reaction in first grade changed the trajectory of my life um, and that it really did send me on this path of having food allergies and mental health as like a career path and a passion project at the same time. Um, and so I would say I, when I was little, um, I always wanted to be a teacher. And so I thought that my direction of like mental health and probably working like as a professor one day um and kind of in my blog kind of all fits into that like teacher idea and so yeah. potentially i maybe would have gone into that and just not have this food allergy part of it um but completely separate when i was in college um i was at ohio state and i worked um in administration for their football team um been a huge football fan my whole life my parents yeah. um my dad went to ohio state and played it's like football massive there. in the u.s you, like because football for us yes. is like kicking it on the field but football for you is <laughs> like the throwing it <laughs> yeah so american yeah. football um they've got their own know. stadiums like yeah it's mad like i always yes. find it so like crazy like yeah exactly yeah. um and that was um i was very big into that and i think that i had the opportunity to stay with them if i um after i graduated college but i had chosen to move to chicago and to pursue my doctoral degree so i think um and a big reason for that was this passion for food allergy mental health and so i think without that i i think that's maybe where i would have been i would have been working in sports i would have loved it i loved my time there um, but I really felt this um, kind of need to to pursue this um, this food allergy, mental health kind of passion um, and kind of like it's even like more than a passion. It's like I very emotionally invested in it um, because yeah. I want I want to help the little kids that were like me at age six having these reactions and not knowing where to turn um, help. Get yeah, back and to I feel. That. Yeah, and it's it's always a crazy one because I've been asked before, like, if you had an allergy, would you like take it back? And it's it's such a hard one. To, obviously, like in some ways, yes, I could eat whatever I want and not risk of like potentially going into anaphylactic shock. But then, like having an allergy, also like for both of us, has like given given us a platform to like help people, okay. and it's given us that like passion project. So not many people in life have the opportunity where they find out what that passion project is or they get into a job which maybe they're not always happy and they lift the weekend. This isn't everyone like, but I'm, I'm saying like, it, it's amazing. Obviously it's kind of gave us a platform now to like help others and given a passion is something we obviously like really enjoy doing. So no, I think that's Did incredible. You? Yeah. How long have you, have you recently, have you just recently graduated then after five years? Are you still studying at the minute? So I graduated my master's. So I did my master's in counseling psychology at the Chicago School as well. Um, I graduated from there in 2021. Um, so about like a year and a half ago. Um, but then I'm continuing on to do my doctorate. So I am in the second year of the doctoral program right now. So I've got about two years left of that. And then I'll match into my internship for the fifth year. So about two more years of school left. Yeah. And how's that been? Have you found that, is there any kind of like key learnings or stuff which has really kind of surprised you whilst doing it? 
Yeah. So, I mean, the food allergy direction has always been, um, it's kind of the specialty that I'm taking. I'm, I'm having my specialty be in health psychology because I am very interested, of course, in the food allergy side. And that's the direction my dissertation is going in. Um, but just in general, I've always, I think, had a passion for psychology that really started when I first went to therapy um, because it was a really beneficial experience for me. And that's when I took my first like um, psychology class in school. And it was something that Amazing. I was interested in. So what I ended up majoring in and in, in college, but it took a while till I decided what direction I wanted to take it. Um, but it has been such a rewarding experience for me to be in this program because you learn so much about yourself. Um, there's a huge emphasis on identifying your diversity variables and how that kind of influences you as a practitioner and as a clinician. Um, and I just feel like I've done so much like introspective work and um, just like self learning. Um, and then yeah, it must how... help. It must help like looking like inside as well because I think it's, it's so easy to look externally, but then so really kind of look at yourself and kind of see how you feel and, and, and how you can grow. That must be incredible. Yeah, it's just as important because you have to understand those things about yourself before you can help somebody else understand those things about themselves. So a huge foundational piece um, of being a therapist or being a psychologist. So that has been a really cool aspect of it that's even just separate from food allergies. Yeah. And I saw, did you, did you, did you volunteer at the Food Allergy Conference for education? Yes. So um, the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research, um, they have their FACES conference um, that I had gone to, I guess, last summer. Um, an amazing conference that they put on here in Chicago. I feel so grateful that I get to, um, you know, have that like right here in my backyard. Like what are yeah. the odds like down the street? Um, an amazing thing. I, I'm, I think they have the date set up for later um, the summer as well in June, and I always look forward to it. Um, they do such amazing work there. Um, this research component is so valuable and having um, the mental health research that's coming out as well as like the epidemiology research. Um, we need that scientific basis in our field and in our community. Um, and they are just doing some really awesome stuff. So if anybody ever gets the opportunity to make it to Chicago, yeah. Um, come to the States and go to the conference. Highly, highly recommend. It's an amazing weekend. Because um, I saw that I saw that on your blog, obviously, with the, the mental health studies, because it's not often you see kind of studies which look at the implications of like anxiety and food allergy together. Before. So that must be like so insightful to kind of hear about their kind of like key findings about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's sort of the direction that I've wanted to take my dissertation as well. So I've been doing um, part of the, the piece of my dissertation that I'm in right now is a literature review. And so it's kind of scanning all of the literature that's out there that's published that has this link of food allergy, mental health. And there's stuff out there, um, but there's not enough. We need more. Um, we're definitely making strides in this direction. I think that this is a conversation that people are starting to have now. Um, but we need as much as we can get. These are really valuable pieces of information that we can get. Um, and we need more insight into it so that we can teach our clinicians, our therapists, our psychologists about this so that when somebody needs a therapist, that they can find somebody who has expert, not even expertise, but at least knowledge in food allergies. Understanding, and, yeah. And, and, and can take these ethical kind of proven, um, you know, clinical approaches and interventions to helping them and so um i really value everything that they're doing and that you know researchers everywhere um that are kind of contributing to this literature review because you know i've got 15 or so sources on there right now but you know i would love to have 100 yeah. you know as many as we can get that um it's so important and when is is the right time to like see a focus or is it just is it I don't know, like, because obviously I've I've not had a therapist specific for my allergies. I feel like now for me it might be a good time because I feel like it's like getting worse sometimes, like in some ways. Really. When is is he a right time, or is is that a bit of a tricky question to answer, kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's definitely individual to each person, so it can be tricky. But I think something that we kind of 
I guess preach in my program is that you don't have to have something quote unquote going wrong to go to therapy. You can feel like your life is going pretty well. Things you have a good handle on stuff and still go to therapy and still benefit from therapy. And so I think that there is kind of the thought that, you know, you have to be really in a tough place or you've really got to be, you know, really struggling to go into therapy that that would be the time. And I don't think that that's the case. I think that if you have the resources to do so, that when you're in a good place can actually be a good a good time to start therapy too, because then when these challenges eventually do come up for you, whether they're food allergy related or not, you've created a relationship with a therapist, you've started building your toolbox, um, and you have an idea of what the therapy process is like, and then you can utilize that to the full extent um, when you need it. Versus, you know, when you come in, when you're really having a tough time, then you're already having a tough time. And so then you're kind of building yourself back up. And so I don't think there's ever a bad time to start. I think the most important yeah. thing is that you start. I think that everybody can benefit um, if they have their resources to do so. And it's just finding that right fit, that right person for you. And with yourself, did you have to go private or would it be public in regards to finding a therapist? Did yes. So I'm not sure, I guess, if Psychology Today, do you guys have Psychology Today? The website? We, psychology Today, no. I've not heard of that one. Is that, okay. is that a US? Yeah. So it, it might be, and I wasn't sure, it might yeah. be like a US and Canada thing, but that's kind of like our main resource that we use in the States is, it's called Psychology Today. It's, um, they have a website and they have a magazine too, I want to say. Um, and you go on there and you can put in like your uh, like your location. You can put in some preferences. So you're like, oh, I want somebody who does this kind of therapy or I want like a male or female. Um, I want them to have oh, that's cool. I'll have to check it out because a lot of it is like online anyway. So yeah, I can't see why, yeah. why I couldn't get someone based over in the US potentially compared right. to the UK maybe. Yeah, so the issue that you run into, um, one, is insurance. So we have to have somebody who's going to be covered by your insurance. So that's definitely um, a barrier that comes up a lot. Um, and then two is that the United States has pretty strict um, kind of like laws and regulations for where therapists can work and like where their clients can be. So like across the state okay. lines can be a big challenge. Um, so for example, like my therapist is licensed in Illinois. And so she has to be in Illinois and I have to be in Illinois like when we work together. And so it's a little bit different for counselors versus therapists versus social workers, which is all legislation that is going through our states right now because we're trying to change this because it is a big issue, um, especially that things are a lot more virtual now. Um, but that can be a challenge too for people that are traveling or out of town or want a food allergy informed therapist but they don't have one in their state, is being yeah. able to practice across those state lines, that's a huge challenge too. And so um, that's definitely legislation that um, we're hoping to change here in the United States. Yeah, because I think I think in the UK, I think, I don't know, I think I would have to go private to get mm -hmm. one which specializes. I know you can go like public um, and get, one for the NHS for like normal CBT, but then to get then someone who specializes in allergies, I think that's gonna be so much more difficult. <laughs> like, um, yes. yeah, so it's a bit of a tricky one. I just wanted to kind of end it on like, in regards to obviously dating with an allergy, before you met your partner, was that something mm -hmm. you found difficult, obviously having an allergy and, and bringing it up and was people quite understanding when you did bring it up? Yeah, so that has always been a topic that I've liked to talk about on my blog as well because I really want to target the young adult population and kind of like the really unique opportunities that we have, but also the really unique challenges that we have. And um, the updating is really a big one of those. And especially in college was sort of the time that I um, had started my blog. And so that's like a big conversation at that time. Um, because all things involved with dating are really involved with food allergies. That's a, you know, first dates oftentimes is going to get a drink, going to get food, yeah. and that is an issue that comes up. And so um, I think the biggest, like, juxtaposition for me um, was my freshman year college roommate. We were paired together because we both had food allergies, and 
Um, I was already with my partner at that time, but she was not with a partner at that time, but she was still dealing with her, um, like, how do you talk to people about yeah, food allergies it yeah. with it? And um, we would always kind of share stories about what was going on. And um, she would be like, well, if I'm going to kiss somebody while I'm at the bar, like, I got to see if they paint a butter before. Like, how do I bring that up? And yeah. it was like, nobody ever teaches you this. This isn't a conversation that we had with our allergists or with our parents. Like, this is something you got to figure out for yourself. And it's life threatening. So you've got to do it well. So we would always worry. Um, she had told me one time that, like, sh somebody had, like, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich as, like, their dinner before they went out. And she was like, thank goodness I asked him. And I was like, yeah, like, you've got to so do that. So scary. Because it's, 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 it's in the Slavo. Is it four hours as well? If, like... That's what they think. Yeah. yeah. Four hours. And, if you know, if you eat other things, it could help. But, I mean, I wouldn't be willing to risk it. I think that's really scary. Yeah, yeah. And so... In my relationship, personally, my boyfriend has been amazing about it. He um, has pretty much given up any of the allergens. I mean, before it was the tree nuts and the seafood, and he wasn't eating those things. Um, but now, just the peanut. But I always kind of share the story because after I had um, kind of tested out of some of the seafood allergens, and I knew that I was clear for those, we had gone to dinner, and I was doing oysters for the first time. And so he was sort of in the clear to get seafood now. And he ordered this like ginormous rack of all of these different seafoods. And he was like, <laughs> I'm going to get try them all now that I can. Um, so he's been so amazing and so sweet about it. And so that's always and been you was And you was absolutely fine. No reactions that night. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so okay, I didn't good, want yeah. to eat. I didn't want to eat it. I don't like the taste or the smell of it, but I'm, I'm yeah, okay yeah. to be around it now. Um, but... I have always said my best dating advice is if it's somebody who is not respectful of your allergies, they're not going to be respectful as you as a person, and that's not mm. somebody you want or. It's a good test, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good test if like if you mention it on a date and like because I get it not too often now like but people used to be like oh like how do you bring it up and I'm sure it still happens if they see like an old video and they're like how do you bring it up but like for me it's like I I always make like a bit of a joke about it but like in a, in a serious way like. Not a serious way. It's like finding the balance, but oh, you've not eaten nuts. So uh, like starting right. that dialogue and like, like you say, if they're not going to take it serious and it's probably best not to go on that second date anyway. Like, right. Yeah. Right. It's not going to be a long term thing if they yeah. don't, if they're not willing to accommodate you. I mean, that's not, yeah. it's not non-negotiable for me. Yeah. And I just wanted to kind of talk, end it on like, where, where do you see obviously allergies um all things allergies and the blog and obviously your studies where where do you see that going in because obviously they go hand in hand so do you mm -hmm. have like a goal set in mind over the next few years of how you kind of what keep building that kind of platform and the community yeah so i've got hopefully some big things you know coming for all things allergies i hope i'm always trying to um you know, do the best that I can to create this resource that I wish I could have had growing up. That's always been my inspiration for it, um, especially in the food allergy direction as my dissertation is continuing. Um, and I think really following along in the literature review, I have an article that I want to come out with or a blog post based on some articles that I had just found in my literature review um, about- Is that to some, do with the airlines? Because I recently saw you post about the airlines, which I thought was really interesting. That, yeah. Yeah. So the airline ones as well. Anytime there's research coming out, just because I'm, I'm so involved in like having to do yeah. like lit reviews and research at school that I'm like, OK, let's break this down so that somebody who doesn't want to read it can like still get the did, information that's valuable. Did you hear about like giving like um, babies like peanut um, when they're infants, 77 um, percent? less likely gonna get allergies i think i think that's right yes. i've seen natasha's foundation posting it and i thought it was super interesting because my sister's just had a baby and she was asking me recently like should i give him nuts and i was like oh, i don't know i was like i've spoke to like a few <laughs> doctors but i like, i don't want to like give her like something which is potentially could make it worse so yeah i thought that was super interesting finding like